Hi, I'm Jack Revell, and this is Continuous Improvement Television, CITV. Today is Monday, May 8th, and we're at the North Campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Today, my guest is Shin Taguchi, the president of the American Supplier Institute located in Allen Park, Michigan. Uh, just as a reminder, next month, uh, June 1995, uh, our guest will be Dr. George Box, uh, one of the world's most renowned classical statisticians. Uh, he'll be coming to us from the campus of the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, be sure to come back and watch us then. Let me tell you a little now about uh, Shin Taguchi. Uh, Shin has been here in the United States since 1970. He's been here about 25 years. And about uh, nine years after he got to the United States, he graduated from, of all places, the University of Michigan, where we are today. Uh, as an industrial engineer, which in case you, you may not have been aware, uh, I'm also an industrial engineer uh, by education and by experience and probably by inclination as well. Uh, today Shin will be talking to us about the uh, concepts of robust design and the quality loss function. Uh, a little bit more about Shin perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps you've heard of his father, uh, Dr. Janichi Taguchi. Uh, the gentleman who developed these concepts that we'll be talking about today, the concepts of robust design and quality loss function, as long as long with uh, a number of other uh, major important technologies. Uh, Dr. Taguchi began to develop and disseminate uh, his, his ideas about robust design and the loss function in the late 1950s uh, in Japan. I believe he first came to the United States around 1960. Uh, he was working with the uh, the folks in New Jersey at uh, AT&T Bell Labs in Homedale, New Jersey. And uh, since that time has acquired a worldwide reputation uh, for the brilliance in his insights uh, in the application of the concepts of quality engineering, uh, design of experiments, robust design, uh, depending on, on what you might want to call it. Today, uh, Shin will be talking us, to us about these concepts and I'd like now to it gives me great pleasure to introduce my guest, Mr. Shin Taguchi. Shin, welcome to Continuous Improvement Television. Uh, is, uh, I think the time is ripe. Uh, uh, Shin will be giving us a, uh, a presentation on the concept of robust design and, and some words on the loss function. By the way, uh, while we're on, you, this is an interactive show. Uh, if you uh, have a question, a comment, a concern that you would like to share either with Shin or myself, be sure to uh, either call in or fax in uh, your question uh, to us here at the University of Michigan, uh, the Michigan Engineering Television Network, METN, here on the North Campus. Uh, the phone numbers are on your screen, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you. Remember, uh, Shin is a very, very busy man. Uh, he tells me despite that despite the fact that he's a, a very expensive consultant, he can be reasonable, right? <laughs> And so, uh, you have an opportunity now for the next two hours to talk to, about, to talk to one of the most interesting and one of the most knowledgeable people in the world on the subject of robust design. And I would urge you, uh, if ever you've had the opportunity, to, to give us a call or, if you prefer, to fax in your questions so that we can take the time to be as responsive uh, to your needs as we can because, frankly, folks, you're our customer and the voice of the customer is what drives us all. Having said all that, uh, let's turn our attention to Shin, and if you'd like to uh, begin your presentation, uh, the audience can call in or fax in their questions uh, at any time. Well, thank you for kind introduction. My pleasure. And uh, I'd like to say it's my pleasure uh, to do this uh, uh, presentation. And please, any question uh, during the presentation is welcome. Uh, I'm here to introduce the key concept of robust design. Uh, key philosophy of robust design and of course it's impossible to introduce everything in uh, less than two hours. Uh, the full-blown course, uh, if you will, in Japan, it takes 20 days uh, to cover everything. So naturally it's not possible to cover everything but I hope I will give the essence of the methodology. I'm sure you do beautifully. Okay, I will try. Please. Um, well, first of all, what, what I'd like to do is uh, start with a slide uh, which unfortunately uh, is not part of your handout. Uh, 
last two years, two and a half years rather, I have been working with uh, uh, Ford Motor Company and have involved in more than 50 robust design projects. And therefore, I have been dealing with uh, 50 teams of engineers. And one of the team happens to be a, a brake uh, development engineering team. And the team said that, that this is, uh, say, conventional approach uh, to engineering. In conventional approach in engineering, basically, today, of course, engineers are faced with, say, a lot of so-called design considerations, mm -hmm. uh, which are decision making in, in engineering, uh, such as what kind of material, what kind of dimension. Uh, <clears throat> what kind of booster to use, and so on and so forth. There are a lot of design considerations. These are the decisions that engineers are faced with uh, to specify <coughs> uh, quite a few decision making. And also, engineers are faced with a lot of requirements. Say, for example, design requirements, uh, such as cost, uh, size, tooling, uh, serviceability, reliability, government regulation, uh, heat dissipation, safety, and so on and so forth. So a lot of design requirements. And not only design requirements, engineers are faced with a lot of so-called performance requirements. Uh, performance requirements such as stopping distance, feel and confidence of the brake, um, brake force, and famous NVH. That's the noise vibration harshness, such as squeal, squeal noise, you know, one of those brake noise. Uh, shuddering. That's the vibration during the braking. Now, why am I showing this? Yeah. Tell me, why are you showing this? <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason I'm showing this is today, engineers are faced with a lot of decision making and a lot of requirements to meet. Mm -hmm. uh, say, there, are, there must be 50 to 100 specifications, including material and dimension, and uh, requirements, maybe more, more than 20, 30 requirements. That's why engineers are so, so busy these days. And Japanese engineers are very busy as well. And I'm sure you have heard of an uh, expression called uh, uh, one stone killing two birds. One, one stone. stone killing two birds. Yeah. Uh, I've heard of two birds killing one stone, but I've never heard the reverse. <laughs> well, how to kill two birds <laughs> is one stone. Oh, OK. Well, the issue is, how can we meet all these requirements? How can we make these, make these decisions and meet all these requirements? Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, just by one stone. And that is called signal-to-noise ratio. Uh -huh. Something called signal-to-noise ratio is at least attempting to do that. So that objective is to make the engineer's life easier. I, I've heard it in, or read about that uh, when your father first developed this concept of signal-to-noise ratio, mm -hmm. uh, he, he, what he was seeing was a parallel, because his background, is, uh, as I recall, his doctorate is in uh, electrical engineering. And he saw the parallel of uh, the, this concept of signal-to-noise ratio in uh, electrical theory here in the area of trying to improve quality. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, he was working with a uh, so-called uh, uh, electrical communication laboratory mm -hmm. in Japan uh, in the 50s. That is, uh, uh, when the uh, American military uh, came to Japan mm -hmm. after the war, uh, they found Japanese telephone system was such a bad quality, mm -hmm. very poor quality, and they suggested Japanese government to create this uh, electrical communication laboratory uh, to improve the uh, quality of the telephone system. Uh, in fact, because uh, you mentioned that, at that time, <coughs> let me introduce a uh, very first application of robust design uh, okay. at the, uh, in Japan. That is, at that time, ECL, that is Electrical Communication Laboratory, and Bell Labs, that's, uh, of course, AT&T AT &T Bell Labs. And at that time, these two companies were asked to develop so-called crossbar switching system, a telephone switching system, that is. And at that time, the budget, in terms of budget, the ratio was, say, 50 to 1. And uh, in terms of manpower, or I should say people power, uh, number of people available, that was a 1 to 5. And number of years taken uh, to develop the product, that was just about the same, around four years each. 
And at the end of development, uh, AT&T uh, compared these two products, one from ECL and one mm -hmm. from uh, Bell Labs. Tell me again, what was ECL? Electrical Communication Laboratory. Okay, and that's located in Japan? In Japan, that's okay. right. They, they are part of the NTNT, that's Nippon Telephone Telephone. Right. And when they compared the uh, quality uh, of the crossbar switching system, which they developed, uh, AT&T decided to purchase a Japanese-made uh, telephone system. Mm -hmm. That is, quality was better and price was less. And this is something your dad had worked on? Yes. At that time, he was responsible at the section uh, which is responsible for <coughs> researching techniques that engineers can use so that their activity, activity can be made effective and efficient. And another example might be, uh, or another point I can make might be something like, you know, vi video cassette tape recorder. Mm -hmm. okay. And for home usage, it came out probably, say, 15 years ago, 18 years ago. And at that time, the design was so bulky and heavy, and especially the mechanical system to put the tape in and mm -hmm. out. But these days, if you look at the system, it's, it's more robust. Uh, it's much lighter, uh, less expensive, simpler. But the point is, it took engineers 18 years to get this point. So the question is, how can we do that, that kind of development, to make the product robust uh, in such a short time? So you wanna, what we're looking for then is a shortcut mm -hmm. to overcome this, this tremendous time duration. That's right. Okay. How to improve performance. Uh, in the shortest time, and therefore also to reduce cost. So let me introduce the concept of so-called signal-to-noise ratio. Please. Now, how do we catch? How do we catch twenty birds with one stone? Twenty birds. Huh? Twenty birds with one stone. Okay. Okay. Um, <coughs> this graphic, which is the slide ten, uh, I have a. Uh, famous tendency to skip around the pages. Okay. So this is page 10 so as long, as long in as the handout. As long as you tell our viewers what page you're on, we can, we can handle anything. Okay. Let's see. So this is using the uh, <coughs> same example, the break. And <coughs> say, this graphic shows so-called intent. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, intent would come from, say, voice of a customer or the voice of market. Yeah. Okay. That is what kind of function that does the market want. Uh, of course, people like to have a break uh, in the car. So every once in a while you can slow down the car. So intent of the brake system is to slow down the vehicle. Okay. So job of engineer is to create a system to meet the intent. And this might be the new concept that is any system has something called input signal. What is input signal? Input signal is a variable which carries the intent and becomes input to the system. So it is easy to see in case of brake that input signal is the force on the pedal. And this can be either physical or electrical? It could be physical or electrical okay. or it could be uh, uh, chemical. Okay. Okay, whatever the, uh, it depends on the system. And I would like to show many examples of the signal today as much as possible. Sure. And how to recognize these signals. But the point is any system has input signal. Now, another important concept is that uh, any system uses energy. You know, without energy, we cannot do anything. That is, uh, say, in case of braking system, uh, after you hit the brake, it it creates the uh, line pressure uh, with the booster, and that goes to the caliper. Caliper squeezes the pad against the rotor, uh, create the friction and heat, heat dissipation, change the torque, so create the stopping force. So you have lots of different energy transformations. That's right. Any system has energy transformations. Uh, injection molding machine is the same way. That is, you know, you melt the material, shoots into dye, and uh, create a product. Any system uses energy. Gotcha. Without energy, we cannot do anything. I have the tr that trouble every day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, job of engineer. What is job of engineer? Job of engineer is to utilize energy transformation, creating the system, create a system to meet the intent. Now, if everything goes well, life is easy. That is, we do everything, try to do everything so that 
as a result of energy transformation, if we will, all the energy will spent on so-called intended output. So in this case, uh, to slow down the car, to stop the car, right. or to create a stopping force. Great. Now, this another concept which is tend to be, I think, is another famous concept nowadays, are uh, called noise factors. Okay, what are the noise factors? Say noise factors are those variables which we cannot control as engineer. Some of which we know about, some of which we don't know about. Yes, and sometimes, yes, we cannot anticipate mm -hmm. uh, some of the noise factors. But say, for example, in case of braking system, uh, what would be the noise factors, Jack? Well, like, for example, uh, water on the street as a result of rain or, or ice as a result of uh, the cold weather. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. sometimes it's there yep. and sometimes it's not. It's not there. Mm -hmm. And so we have to have a system, I would assume, that can accommodate uh, a, a condition of the streets that either where water may be present or not present, mm -hmm. as an example. And engineer cannot specify that. That's right. That is, uh, they, they have to design a system, though, that uh, will will be able to work completely and properly uh, as as intended, despite the presence or non-presence of that noise factor. Exactly. And noise factors are typically the usage condition, environment, uh, aging, uh, such as hardware uh, change. Yeah change of the viscosity in the brake fluid. You keep talking about aging. I, I re couldn't you talk about something <laughs> else? <laughs> well, the, you know, because product is, is uh, designed to last okay. for so many years. How, how well I know. <laughs> well, by the way, you know, there was, uh, this CROSPA system, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was actually uh, developed in the 50s. It's still working. It's really? It's system somewhere, wow. somewhere in China. That was my, my first time in Japan was in the late 50s. Oh, okay. In 1957. So, so you might have... Uh, I, I used one of those ones, <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. The problem is noise factors. Okay, there are... Well, noise factors play a game on you and uh, creates variability, uh, therefore creates the problems. Uh, and we cannot specify noise factors. We cannot control noise factors. Uh, that is to say, for example, you cannot ask a uh, driver to apply the brake between the temperature of uh, 5 degrees and 20 degrees. You know, we cannot control that. And problem is, these noise factors causes variability, variability in energy transformation. Okay, let's put more, okay. okay. In energy transformation, and creates a response, or the output, if you will, other than intended. These are undesirable offshoots, if you will. That's right, such as squeal noise, uh, excess wear, uh, vibration, and so on and so forth. And I asked uh, Blake engineer, do you design the Blake so that it squeals? And they said, no, no, this is something undesirable. So concept of signal to noise ratio, the conceptually is, is it's quite simple. Mm -hmm. That is, the numerator in signal to noise ratio is energy or power that uh, transform to the intended output. Mm -hmm. That's a numerator. And denominator is energy or power. The power is the rate of energy. Transform to other than intended output. So that's the good stuff over the bad stuff. You can put it that way. Okay. Good energy divided by bad energy, or good power divided by bad power. Gotcha. In the output. Therefore, higher this ratio, higher this ratio, the system is doing what it's supposed to do in the phase of noise factor. Mm -hmm. System is doing as intended what it's supposed to do in the phase of noise factor. And that's called uh, signal to noise ratio. Right. Now, why is this concept so important? Okay, uh, let me explain that. Maybe you are supposed to ask that question. It, anyways, why is this important? Because it's such a common sense. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a common sense. The reason it's so important is the following, that uh, often in the development, what we do is that we make a prototype, uh, develop a prot prototype from the concept, then we do testing. We do testing to find the problems. And suppose, suppose squeal happened to be a very important problem. That is, suppose this new prototype we tested, and suppose it squeals too much. Then what we do? We try to reduce the squeal. Mm -hmm. It's a quality problem. Nobody likes it. So we try to reduce it. That's a problem. So then, for, ex for example, would the performance requirement might be to reduce the decibel level of the squeal noise associated with the application of the brake. That's brake. right. That would be the requirement. Mm -hmm. However, 
The idea is, by suppose you are able to reduce the square noise, but does it guarantee to increase signal to noise ratio? You see, how many times have you experienced solving one problem creates another problem? Mm -hmm. So suppose, for example, suppose you are able to reduce the square, but suppose you might, you might inc increase the vibration, or you might create another symptom. The point is, by maximizing the signal to noise ratio, what we are trying to do is to reduce the symptoms without measuring the symptoms. Uh -huh. You see, a big question comes to, my, to mind is, in that case, what do we measure as a data? You see, in, so we don't measure these symptoms as a data. But the question is, what do we measure as a data? In fact, the idea is to measure energy transformation in the phase of noise factor and look for the design so that this variability of energy transformation is minimized. Then you tend to get rid of the symptoms. And I will, uh, my intention is, of course, is to introduce uh, those strategies. Then what do we measure as a data? What is the thought process to recognize uh, what to measure as a data? So I'd like to go through those examples. Please, yes, let's do. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to come back to this break example uh, later on and explain. Uh, actually, there are two companies actually done uh, this kind of experiment on the break system. But I only have a permission from one, one of the company. That's for so, yeah. Well, that's Nissan, actually. Oh, okay. yeah. And uh, I'm going to talk about that Good, okay. later on. Um, <clears throat> before talking about uh, this uh, strategy, let me talk a little bit more about uh, well, before talking about example, let me talk a little, little more about the concept. Please. Okay. In this slide, that is slide three of uh, uh, 20 pages. <coughs> so I introduced noise factors, the idea of noise factors, introduced the intent, okay. and there's a result. And here's a definition of noise factors. Uh, so you can look at the definition of noise factors. Okay. Okay. Now, let me introduce another item, which is called control factors. Okay. Control factors are those parameters which, as an engineer, we have control over, which something we can control and specify, are called control factors. Like, for example, for the braking system, uh, control factors are uh, such factors such as uh, pad material, amount of additive in the material, uh, cure pressure, cure temperature to make the pad. And these things are something engineer has uh, power to control and specify. And many of these things engineer do have uh, control, especially in the early stage of development. So the idea of how to achieve robustness is to utilize control factor. That is, going back to this slide, we formulate experimentation using something called orthogonal array. And frankly speaking, uh, personally, uh, you know, you can use full factorial or fractional factorial or even one factor at a time experiment uh, or even shotgun approach. But uh, we recommend to use orthogonal array. And later, uh, if I, we, we have time, we can uh, introduce orthogonal array as well. But basically, it's a design of experiment matrix, uh, which has a certain property called orthogonality. It's a balanced experimentation matrix. If, if I recall, an orthogonal array is a, uh, a mm -hmm. fractional factorial, which is a subset of a full factorial design, uh, where the, the levels of the, of the various factors or parameters uh, are set up with an, 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 an occur at e an equal number of times for, for each of the various levels. That's right. So therefore, you end up with balanced experimentation. Yes. It's, a, uh, it's a tool. Uh, it's a tool which engineer can use uh, very easily. It's been made as standard, and it's very u easy to use. Yeah, my experience with it is, has been uh, that by using it, it simplifies the mathematics mm -hmm. of analyzing the results of the experiment considerably. Mm -hmm. Yes, and... Uh, well, maybe just to show the idea, <coughs> um, this shows the list of, for example, the uh, 
tidy manufacturing process control factors. Mm -hmm. Say amount of limestone, uh, fineness of additive, amount of agarometrite, so on and so forth. And these are the control factors. And these are so-called levels of the control factors. If I recall, Shin, isn't this mm -hmm. the, uh, from the paper that you won the award from the American Society for Quality Control, you and Diane Byrne, a few years ago? Uh, we use this ex as an example yeah. in the paper, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so these are the control factors and levels. These are the way we change ex uh, these control factors in the experiment. And orthogonal array will be <coughs> matrix, which looks like this one, just like that. Okay, so th down the left-hand side, these are the, uh, the various experimental runs. That's right. And across the top, we have the uh, various factors that are going to be considered that's right. that we saw on the previous sheet. In the experiment. And that's we right. call this an L18 because there's, there's 18 experimental runs in this particular right. uh, uh, setup. That is, that is right. And we end up with this 18 runs of control factors. And uh, this particular table has certain property, which is very powerful. Mm -hmm. And uh, so orthogonal itself is very mechanical and it's very useful uh, tool. Uh, however, in order to achieve robust design, if I describe it this way, that is, robust design is design of experiment plus engineering strategy, or say approach to engineering. That is, what to measure as a data. Uh, how do you treat the control factors and noise factors? Mm -hmm. And these are the engineering strategy, and uh, especially what to measure as a data and how to calculate the signal to noise ratio. And that engineering part, if you will, the software part of design of experiment is very important. In fact, when we formulate the experiment, it usually takes, um, say, three, four, five half day meetings, uh, even more. Uh, time to formulate experiment. Mm -hmm. You know, you haven't mentioned it, but uh, I think it's appropriate to uh, just for our for our viewing audience to know that uh, this this whole concept of robust design applies not just to products but to processes as well. So, if you have a process uh, that is of uh, concern to you that you know that for example perhaps it's not performing as well as you feel it ought to that from time to time uh, you're you're producing uh, products with excessive variation or with with uh, an unacceptable level of defects uh, that by des designing or redesigning that process using the concepts of robust design that Chin is talking about that you're able to do, uh, accomplish the same kinds of things that you can in the design of the products that he, that he is talking about right now. Thanks. Okay, so let me continue with more strategy. Please. Um, in fact, we have many uh, process examples uh, such as machining, uh, injection molding, uh, stamping and so on, welding. Yes. We, uh, we've used ex an extensive number of uh, experiments uh, with my employer, uh, Use Aircraft Company. Oh, yes. And uh -huh. more specifically, where I'm located today at Use Missile Systems Company mm -hmm. in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we have probably used more experiments in designing processes mm -hmm. than we have in designing products. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been probably 50 50. The half of the application has been processed, and the other half will be. Uh, product development. Yeah, they're certainly both important. Yes, and and of course, uh, you know, so-called concurrent engineering, mm -hmm. simultaneous engineering, and uh, what you like to do is develop product, robust product function, and robust manufacturing process function simultaneously. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So that's uh, that would make happen. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> We probably ought to mention that mm -hmm. those those pages that you were just using are were unnumbered pages mm -hmm. that our uh, our audience does not have in their in their collection of handouts. Uh, yes. As as is this one that we were about to show them. That, mm -hmm. That's what made me think of it. Yeah, this one is also a page uh, that uh, you don't have, but it's a very simple page. So let me uh, go through that. Um, Say so I introduced the idea of control factors and noise factors, and in this page, what it shows is that. Product development development cycle, uh, upstream mm -hmm. to downstream. Let, let's get that uh, a little bit larger so everybody can read it, since they okay. don't have a copy of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. There we go. And upstream, the most up, upstream will be research and development. Where we begin. Advanced engineering, and I intentionally put the product planning, 
over here, mm -hmm. specific product planning, and of course, uh, QFD, quality funds. Absolutely, yeah. And over here might be a tips, uh, which... Uh, yeah, for those of you who do mm -hmm. not have the opportunity or the good fortune to watch Steve Angvari, uh, the president of the American Supplier Institute International, uh, with us on this uh, series in February of this year, Steve talked to us about TIPS, the theory of innovative problem solving, uh, the Russian acronym, this, this being a, uh, a technique that was developed in Russia and was brought over here to the United States just a few years ago. The Russian acronym is TRIZ, T-R-I-Z. The uh, English acronym, as Shin just pointed out, is TIPS, the theory of innovative problem solving, and that's what uh, Shin is referring to here uh, at the the far upstream uh, end of the uh, product development cycle. Uh, that is to create the concepts and uh, to generate the concept. Um, <coughs> then here's the product design, process design, and manufacturing uses and recycle. So that's that. This shows the uh, whole product de development cycle. And as far as number of control factors and number of noise factor goes. Let's look at the control factors. Obviously, you have more control factors in upstream stage, don't we? Mm -hmm. That is, as you go downstream, it's going to cost more money to change the design. Sure. Uh, in the research and development, advanced engineering, there are many things we can try. And on the other hand, noise factors would increase as you go downstream in the de development cycle. That is, Manufacturing, in the manufacturing, there are many noise factors, causes of variations, uh, users, environment, uh, aging. Again, I mentioned that. And increases as time goes. So the idea is, what we love to do is create robust function in the upstream stage. Where you've got a maximum number of control factors and a minimum number of noise factors. Exactly. When even we have, before even product planning, to measure the function, to make the function robust. And of course, one trick is to anticipate the noise factors in upstream stage so that we can uh, prevent the quality problems in the downstream stage. I've, I've heard it said that about 80% of the cost of a program or a project mm -hmm. is committed by the time you get to the uh, uh, product planning stage. Mm -hmm. that, that once once you get into uh, the area of uh, product design and process design, 80% of all the funding, the budget has already been committed. Mm -hmm. And that makes it even more important to do what you're talking That's about. Right. That's right. And it's more effective to do it. More upstream, more effective it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, let me draw something here. Okay. And I've been drawing this uh, uh, quite a bit. I'm going to change color and see like this. What do you think this is? It uh, looks like some buildings burning. <laughs> what is it? Yeah, fire. <laughs> it is a fire, yeah. you devil. <laughs> <laughs> you know, firefightings. Ah, I'm with you. I'm with you, of course. Quality problems. Sure. Uh, warranty problems, mm -hmm. uh, defects and failures in the field, uh, recalls, all these firefightings. And it's so surprising that uh, I've been doing this for the last uh, uh, 13 years, 14 years in North America. And I've been talking to engineers, and uh, they say about 75% of their time is spent on firefighting. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the time, typically, they have to do the paperwork. <laughs> so they say, you know, they don't have enough time to do engineering. And that is a big problem. And uh, Jack, uh, you may uh, have heard of a game called uh, Whack a mole. Let me put this one over here. Whack a mole. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's an arcade game. Yeah. Where you know there are several holes in the. Uh, you know, you put a like, couple quarters in, and uh, you play. You hit the guy. You know, if you hit it well, it goes down. And another one comes out, and you comes out, and you hit it again. Life is like that. Yeah. So this firefighting engineering, we call it whack a mole engineering. You see. Okay, and I assume that this is the mole that, whose head is, is sticking up out of the, the hole. And That's right. The That's job right. Is, to, is to whack it with, with the mallet. That's right. So it's a firefighting engineering. That is, there's a problem. Let's put out the fire. And once fire is out, there's another fire comes out. And you hit it hit with a hammer. And pretty soon you need several mallets, and then you need more hands. That's right. 
And uh, in fact, I have to say, in 80s, uh, application of what's called so-called Taguchi methods, you might have called mm -hmm. Taguchi methods, uh, I have to say, most of application has been this Wakamon engineering. After, after the fact? After the fact. Uh, solving, problem solving, uh, reactive to the problem. Uh, like it's summarized on this page. This is another one of those pages that they don't have a yes, copy of. I apologize. Okay, so Taguchi methods in so-called 1980s has been this problem focus, firefighting, reactive, downstream, reliability problem solving, mm -hmm. specific product focus. And I'm going to emphasize this point again later. Okay. It's a very important uh, point. That is, instead of doing specific product problem solving, let's develop the technology robust to prevent the problems. You know, now, Shana, some of our, our viewers may have heard the term Taguchi methods. Mm -hmm. uh, they may have heard of robust design mm -hmm. and quality engineering. Mm -hmm. Could you take just a moment to differentiate between these, these and other terms that have been used, I think, interchangeably, but perhaps uh, mm -hmm. they, they have a different meaning? Um, well, Dr. Taguchi came to the United States in, uh, actually he was with Princeton in the 60s for one year. But uh, he came back to the United States uh, in 1980 uh, to Bell Labs and to Xerox, and in 1982 to Ford Motor Company. Mm -hmm. And so those three places are the pioneer in this uh, approach uh, of robust design. Uh, However, because it was very different from, say, traditional DOE itself, uh, people in Xerox started to call this Taguchi methods. And that's why this name, Taguchi method, became uh, uh, well known in American engineering society. Now, I, I know that the <coughs> term Taguchi methods has been copyrighted. Uh, because I, I've seen the little C with the circle oh, yes. around uh -huh. next to mm -hmm. Taguchi methods. Mm -hmm. I've also heard that your dad uh, does not really feel comfortable with that term. Mm. It's very unusual that uh, in Japan you know, they use the somebody's last name as a name of the method. Uh -huh. uh, so that's why uh, Dr. Taguchi started calling this quality engineering. Quality engineering. Okay, and so we can <coughs> we can equate quality engineering with Taguchi methods that the two terms are mean exactly the same thing? Uh, however, in the States, quality engineering, the term is more broad. Uh, therefore, we are having problem what to call, in fact. Uh, and, that, and that's how you kind of transitioned into robust design? That's right. Which is a, a much more descriptive term mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what it is that you're trying to mm -hmm. do. And in fact, uh, the way we have been uh, teaching and the way we have been applying uh, were more in problem solving in mm -hmm. 80s. So, and people understand Taguchi methods as almost like a problem solving tool. Uh, however, we took evolution. That is, in by the time late 80s or so, uh, we took a shift, if you will. Uh, and now we are talking about more on function focus, uh, fire prevention, more proactive, upstream, built-in reliability, and technology focus. And again, I will emphasize this point again. That is, instead of working on specific product, let's develop the generic technology. And uh, upstream robust design and function breakdown and synthesis. Mm -hmm. And I will explain what we mean by function breakdown as well. OK. okay. So we have taken such a, a evolution uh, in from 80s to 90s. and. Uh, so, we, so <coughs> even robust design is undergoing continuous improvement. You're right. That's right. And this approach of robust design uh, in upstream engineering, uh, it's been only popular for the last 10 years or 12 years mm -hmm. or so, uh, say, even in Japan as well. So uh, we have created so-called quality engineering forum. Well, we haven't uh, decided a name yet. Uh, it might be called something to do with Taguchi, but uh, in the North America. Uh, in Japan, they have formed forum already, uh, and they have about 1,300 uh, members in Japan. Uh, the forum is, uh, is an organization, like an, an association? Association. Or it's uh, in it more informal than a place like uh, IEEE or ASME. Okay. It's smaller, smaller and more informal. Okay, but uh, and focus specifically on the use of this particular approach or concept? Yes, that's right. Okay, what I'd like to do is... Uh, mention about just one more thing about the noise factor. 
Okay. And <clears throat> while you're selecting your slide, let me mention to our, our audience that uh, we haven't had any phone calls or faxes yet. And uh, I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, uh, this is a, a tremendous opportunity for you to, uh, to get inside the mind of somebody who's got some facts and some figures and some ideas. And I'm sure you, you and your organizations can make good use of. So I would encourage you, uh, before, we, uh, before we leave here uh, at the end of the two-hour session, that uh, you, you make your questions or your concerns known to Shin, uh, either through the use of the, uh, the telephone or the fax, so that uh, he can respond to your concern uh, real time. Shin, go ahead. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Now, uh, there's only uh, so many things we can do about the noise factors. That is, uh, noise factors create the problems, mm -hmm. and start the fires, and defects and failures and quality problems. Now, uh, as an engineer, what are the things we can do about the noise factors? And there are only four, four types of countermeasures we can apply against the noise. And this page, which is page seven uh, mm -hmm. in your handout. Finally, we got the one that they have. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, <clears throat> the one thing we could do is, of course, ignore noise. And one of my colleagues insists this is one of the countermeasures we can apply against noise. Uh, that is, he claims that uh, some cases people are controlling certain things where they don't have to control. That is, if noise is, certain noise is not important, you know, we don't have to control, we can ignore. Interesting, okay. Mm -hmm. But however, most of the cases, ignoring is a problem. Uh, later on, it's gonna cause problem. Now, the second type of countermeasure is to control or eliminate the noise itself. Uh, for example, tighten the tolerance. Uh, do you know this word? Pokeyoke, yeah, mista yeah. mistake proofing. Mis yep. used, used to be bakayoke. Yep, that's right. <laughs> That's a Japanese word for food proofing, yeah. mistake proofing. And that certainly is a countermeasure. Right. And uh, standardization, uh, like operating uh, standard, uh, operation procedure standard, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And these are controlling, eliminate the noise itself. And by definition, of course, some of these noise factors we cannot control. However, uh, these are, if we will, traditional quality assurance activities. Uh, like SPC is an excellent uh, tool to get to this. That is, uh, to control the special causes. Mm -hmm. to Just to identify that they exist. Yeah, and to prevent the real mm -hmm. and so on by improving the standard. And th you know, I'm, not, I'm uh, not against you know, doing these things. And uh, like pokayoke, a simple investment of uh, say $200 would uh, say prevent the problem of half million dollars. Sure. Then you should do that. Um, however, overdoing can be a problem uh, because this kind of countermeasure is cost-quality trade-off. Cost-quality trade-off. Okay. That is, whatever the countermeasure here, it's going to cost some money. And the idea is, if you're overdoing this, uh, it's a problem. That is, if you think high quality means expensive, maybe you're thinking about trying to control and eliminate the noise itself. Another type of countermeasure, uh, this one is something engineers love to do, uh, compensation. Mm -hmm. Before the fact, after the fact. Uh, say feedback control is you compensate after the fact. Uh, like something like ABS, example would be uh, anti-lock brake system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's nothing but, it's a subsystem, it's a feedback control subsystem. Yeah, this is something that Dr. Fagenbaum talks about extensively in his book on total quality control. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but ABS, adding ABS is inc will increase the cost. Mm -hmm. But brake itself is not robust against ice, therefore they have to add the ABS. So, of course, sometimes we have to do this. Mm -hmm. But again, this kind of countermeasure is cost quality trade-off. Uh, feed forward control, adaptive control. Uh, similar thing. That is... Uh, this is adding complexity to the existing system to compensate for the inability of the system that's right. uh, to be robust as it's currently designed. That's right, exactly. This will make it robust, however, exactly. But it, but it adds complexity and cost. Complex and expensive. And However, if certain noise is so dominating, you know, we have to apply this kind of countermeasure. Mm -hmm. So usually we use 
so-called loss function to make decisions whether to do these two types of countermeasure. Now, the last type of countermeasure is something what we call parameter design. That is to minimize the impact of noise by changing control factor levels. And you have the best chance to reduce the variability of the function uh, without increasing cost. Okay, so one, once you've identified what the various control parameters are, mm -hmm. and you know specifically which ones you want to experiment with, mm -hmm. then we go into this parameter design phase mm -hmm. and uh, set up the various parameters at the whatever number of levels we determine we want to test at mm -hmm. as a, uh, using the orthogonal array mm -hmm. in order to create the robust design that we're targeting for. Mm -hmm. So let me summarize uh, the what we call an uh, engineered system, then... Uh, this is on slide nine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you have this copy. So the strategy is as follows. And after the break, what I'd like to do is uh, give at least uh, two examples okay. uh, using this approach to create a robust design. Uh, one example I'm going to use is a break example where they reduce the cost, reduce the size, uh, improved the performance and eliminated the uh, squeal, squeal noise, uh, but just by measuring one item. You've got to be pretty savvy, though, to know which item to identify. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the hard part. Yes, and that takes a lot of, uh, say, brainstorming and uh, discussions. Mm -hmm. So after the break, I will talk about okay. those examples. So the idea is, <coughs> say, any system like we talked about, it's going to face noise factors, uh, environment, and time. And more upstream you are, you have a lot of control factors. And typically, we define them with A, B, C, D, these sure. uh, alphabet. Then we assign experiment, <coughs> design of experiment, or we formulate the experiment with control factors. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to recognize difference between control factors and noise factors. Then, in the experiment, we vary the signal and noise intentionally. Uh, we vary the input signal, and we vary the noise factors even, intentionally. Mm -hmm. We need to anticipate the noise. So that the object, then we measure output, what we call output response, the data. And the big question is what to measure as the data. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. After the break, I'm going to talk about this, however, in the break example, they vary the hydraulic pressure and they measure torque. That is, they recognized one subsystem in the braking system. Uh, they did experiment on the pad and rotor, mm -hmm. pad and rotor of the brake system. They recognized the function is to transmit pressure into torque. And that's what it's supposed to do. So measure the torque by varying the pressure and noise factor. And another big question is how to vary noise factors, how to anticipate the noise, how to vary the noise factors, and such as the environment. You usually take the extremes of the, of the range of the noises, don't you? That's right. We take, in terms of energy, we typically vary only two noise conditions, low response, high response noise conditions. Low being the, the lowest anticipated one that it would normally occur, and high being the, the other end of the range. Yes, and at least a tendency. Mm -hmm. Ten, N1 is a noise condition which tends to give low torque, which tends to give low torque. N2 is a noise condition which tends to give high torque. Gotcha. And uh, after the break, I will be more specific about this. Yeah, we need to be clear. We're talking about two different breaks. This is the brake system, mm -hmm. and we're going to take a break. Oh, that's right. <laughs> After the break, we'll cover the break example. Okay, yes. and uh, let me let me kind of bring this this uh, this first hour to a close, mm -hmm. uh, ladies and gentlemen. We've been uh, talking with Shin Taguchi about uh, using uh, robust design and the quality loss function uh, to minimize variability reduction as a part of design of both products and processes. Uh, we're going to take about a 10-minute break from uh, 25 minutes after the hour to about uh, 25 minutes before the hour. And when we come back, Shin will continue with his presentation. Once again, I encourage you to uh, 
consider any questions or uh, comments that you would like to make to Shin or myself and either call them in or fax them in. We'll be here during the break, so if you'd like to uh, make contact with us during the break, we'll certainly be available. Uh, other than that, uh, we'll see you in about 10 minutes. You all take care. Welcome back. Uh, again, I'm Jack Revell. This is Continuous Improvement Television, May 8th, 1995, at the North Campus of the University of Michigan. Today, my guest is Shin Taguchi, the president of the American Supplier Institute International, talking about using robust design and the quality loss function to reduce variability. Uh, this is the second hour of Shin's presentation. Let me tell you a little bit more about Shin before he gets back on the, on the podium. Uh, Shin tells me that he has trained something around 18,000 people, 18,000 engineers uh, over the last 13 years is that he's been acting as a consultant in talking to people about robust design, quality engineering, and the Taguchi methods. This comes from something around 100 companies in virtually every continent in the world. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very experienced consultant and hopefully you're, you're going to find uh, even more uh, revelations relative to the, the concepts of design for product and process. During the break, uh, we received uh, two calls. The first call we got was from the Polaroid Corporation, and where is, where is that note, Shin? Uh, a gentleman named Harris Miller from the Polaroid Corpor Corporation called, and he had several in interesting comments to make that Shin will be addressing as a part of his presentation later on in this, uh, the second hour of our uh, our uh, presentation today and I'm told that we have another caller uh, on the line right now is and uh, if uh, the oh, the callers not on the line now they they'll be calling back in just a little while okay uh, forgive me I got my my uh, wires crossed there uh, not a very robust condition obviously so until our uh, our caller comes back this is a caller I'm told from uh, Eastman Kodak uh, Shin will continue with his presentation back on slide nine of, uh, of your handouts. Shin? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so let me continue with this uh, idea of uh, input signal, output response, control factors, and noise factors. And so if you're aware, this is the new engineering paradigm. And the idea is we want to formulate the experiment with control factors then we vary the input signal and selected noise factors, selected noise conditions. We vary them intentionally and measure the response. So objective is to find out what are the combination of control factors such that system will transmit the signal as the way as intended and insensitive without affected by noise factors. Okay. So that's the, our strategy. So uh, let me let me use a thing they, they call uh, active listening. Okay. Uh, I'll repeat it back in my own words. Make sure, sure. Please we understand. So. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do then is in our, in the setting up of our designed experiment to create this robust design condition is to identify the appropriate levels of the various control factors, the things that we can control, mm -hmm. so that the output is the, the kind of output within specification that we're looking for, minimizing the, the influence or uh, decreasing the sensitivity of the system mm -hmm. to the influence of these noise factors. Mm -hmm. So by setting these control factors at the right levels, the, the presence or absence of the noise factors is inconsequential because it gives us consistently this, the kind of output that we're looking for. That's right. Is that That's correct? Right. Okay. Exactly. Um, so let me use 
the example from the break. Okay, okay. I, Shin, I'm, I'm told that our, our caller has yeah. uh, uh, made his, his way through the uh, uh, information highway. Mm -hmm. uh, caller, please identify yourself by, by name and organization, uh, perhaps lo and location. Uh, yes, uh, this is Zig Kakil from East Minnesota Company. In Rochester, New York. We have lost our caller. Hello? Hello? Uh, are you located in Rochester, New York? Yes, I am. Okay, uh, uh, what is your question, please? Uh, my question for Dr. Taguchi is, uh, does he have any experience or could he comment on the application of robust design methodology uh, to manufacturing processes using analytical models of those processes versus experiments? Shin? Uh, yes, uh, uh, in fact, uh, many experiments these days uh, do use analytical models. Uh, not only analytical models, but also the uh, simulation package, computer simulation package, such as SPICE uh, for circuit simulation, uh, various finite element uh, package. And also, we use analytical model. If model is available, uh, we can uh, formulate experiment using that model. Uh, and there are some strategies that uh, how to incorporate noise, incorporate noise factor in the model. Uh, it can be done. And uh, use of the model is great because uh, you can let the computer do the experiment. And it's obviously usually much cheaper and much faster. Off the top of your head, uh, in continuing uh, the same question, mm -hmm. can you think of an example of, of something like this uh, that you can recall? Uh, product design, I, I have many examples, such as uh, steering system, uh, suspension system, uh, wiper movement, you know, automotive wiper movement system. Uh, in manufacturing process, uh, actually, I know the fact that uh, there is a company in uh, California, uh, they're developing simulation program for semiconductor uh, manufacturing. And they are, they are incorporating robust design with the software as well. No, that's terrific. You don't yeah. have to recall the name, do you? Um, I can't find that information uh, back in the office. Uh, this Japanese company is involved in it. That's why I know about it. A uh, Japanese company is called Nippon Musen. Nippon mm -hmm. Musen is the name of uh, name of the company. So if any of our, our uh, viewers were interested in finding out about this company that's developing this, this software, the simulation software that mm -hmm. incorporates robust design, mm -hmm. uh, they could call ASI uh, in uh, Allen Park uh, yes. and get uh -huh. that information? Yes, uh, you're welcome to do so. And okay. I encourage that. Okay, uh, if our caller is still on the air, uh, do you, uh, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, it did. Thank you. Thank you very much for calling. Thank you. And let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that uh, we'll, uh, we're going to be on the air for another uh, 45 minutes or so. So I would encourage you, uh, uh, as uh, several people already have, to, to give us a call uh, or send in your fax and see if we can respond to your uh, concern or your question. Shin, uh, let's, let's go on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me go through one quick example, uh, which I promised to do. Uh, by Nissan that uh, they have killed 10, 20 birds with one stone. So what they did is the following. Uh, the first of all, uh, when we conduct experiment, typically, uh, it doesn't have to, but we typically we divide into subsystems. And mm -hmm. this is very roughly done, uh, the whole brake system. Uh, and this is a brake pedal, and this is the uh, stopping force. And uh, because conducting experiment, uh, even if with simulation, you know, from here to here is usually such a big system. So typically, we divide into subsystem. Just like with QFD. Yes, that's right. Then subsystem by subsystem. Exactly. Uh, make it robust. And I have a little more comment about that one later. Then they look at this subsystem, which is pattern rotor. And first thing they did was rotor to recognize what is the input signal? And what is the output response? And when you think about this so-called input signal and output response, it's always a good idea to think about energy transformation. 
what kind of energy transformation take place? Uh, same thing with the manufacturing process, uh, coating process, stamping, uh, welding, uh, whatever the process is. Uh, again, you know, variability of energy transformation causes quality problems. So in this example, they recognized input signal will be the line pressure. Like I mentioned before the uh, break, and output response mm -hmm. is the torque. Mm -hmm. That is, <coughs> the pressure that was created by the, uh, the booster and brake line is the input signal. And this, using this pressure, uh, part is squeezed against water. Mm -hmm. And depending on where you cut the system, the output response could be, uh, say, it could be friction or actually heat dissipation itself. But after that, function is to generate the torque. So this is what, what we call the input signal and output response. And one... Let me ask a question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so please. This is so minor, I almost hesitate to ask. Please do so. Something I've of, often wondered, in, in, in I've been reading about mm -hmm. uh, robust design, I guess, uh, about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. the, the input, uh, that's a, a capital M, isn't it? Capital M, yes. Why? What does the M stand for? Um, you got me on that. Okay, I just, I just want, I, I feel yeah. better. Uh -huh. Okay, because I, I've, I've, you know, I sit there and I yeah. scratch my head and I wonder why. One reason maybe because uh, for noise factor we use capital N. Yes. So, M, M is one before N. Okay. Maybe that's a, that may be the reason. It's as good as any. Uh -huh. we'll proceed. And, well, uh, actually, Dr. Taguchi is in town uh, this week, so mm -hmm. I, I'll ask him. Yeah, as a matter of fact, folks, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Shin and his, his lovely wife, Junko, uh, and their, their darling daughter, Hana, and Dr. Taguchi and I all had dinner together at a, uh, a really terrific uh, uh, Korean restaurant last mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who may wonder, Dr. Taguchi is in excellent health. Uh, he's 71 years old now. Uh, doing well, traveling around the world, uh, as is Shin, uh, providing their understanding and their knowledge of robust design. But for those people who are uh, wonder about uh, Dr. Taguchi, he's in excellent health, and it uh, looks to me like he's going to go on forever. He's going to be another Dr. Deming. Shin? And the uh, food was great. The uh, food was delicious. Lots of garlic. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, okay, let's get back to this uh, break example so that uh, uh, people can see how you can meet those requi requirements okay. at once. Now, we said, all right, this is the energy transformation, or input signal and output response. And sometimes it's not easy to recognize what the signal should be, what the response should be, and usually it takes time to uh, discuss this. Absolutely, that's one of the hardest parts. Yes. Now, there's something called ideal function. That is, based on the physics, what is the ideal relationship between this Y and M? And in this case, as you can see, the, uh, it's power in, power out. Mm -hmm. uh, and so believe it or not, usually... Some kind of one-to-one -one correspondence. One-to-one -one correspondence, and Y equal to beta M happens to be, in most of cases, the ideal function. So beta is the slope of the, of the line. That's right. And of course, reality is much more complex function. Y response, the torque is a function of many, many variables. Certainly. Uh, and reality happens to be it, it's going to look more like this. Lots of variability. Okay, so there's a, a whole envelope of possible responses. Yes, uh, time to time, uh, within the braking, uh, over the life of the brake, brake, brake performance, uh, different ambient temperature, uh, different uh, air pressure, and so on and so forth. The age of the system. Age of the system, exactly. So there's variability in mm -hmm. function. And of course, objective is to make this one looking more like, more robust. That is, under same noise condition, okay, under same noise condition, we look for the control factor, control factor combination, so it's gonna look like this. Try to minimize that variation. Yes. To de right. desensitize the relationship. Desensitize against the noise factors. Mm -hmm. And in this case, also, you like to have this slope to be high. The slope itself is a efficiency. Slope itself is efficiency. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, engineer has been looking at efficiency. However, here, the question is not only efficiency, but even before efficiency, the priority is to reduce variability of the efficiency. Then, of course, higher the efficiency is a better system. 
Um, so the approach <coughs> to take for this uh, kind of experiment is taking back to this uh, graphic again. There are control factors, say control factors, and noise factors. So formulate the experiment with control factors uh, using Typically, we tend to use L18 these days. Uh, most of experiments have been L18, and I'm not going to get into explanation for that. One reason is because may, you can take many three-level factors, control factors, mm -hmm. and vary the pressure and vary the noise. Okay. In other words, for each experimental run, we collect the data, which we vary the signal and vary the noise. So how do we do that? Each data set is going to look like this. Say, we're going to vary the signal and noise and measure the response. Okay. So signal is varied, like for example, uh, different values, say 4, 8, 16, 24. And remember, this is a pressure, hydraulic pressure. That's how to pronounce for me, by the way. And this Say it again, what is it? Hydraulic pressure. Hydraulic? Hydraulic. Thank That's you close. That's close. Close enough. Yeah. Thank you. Close enough for TV work. <laughs> oh, <Okay>. yes, I'd <coughs> forgotten about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then we vary the uh, pressure. Then we're going to also vary the noise. Mm -hmm. okay. And the way they vary the noise is such as, as follows. That is, only two noise conditions, for example, uh, let's see, zero degrees, uh, 120 degrees, 80% uh, worn pad, 5% worn pad. Now, <coughs> N1 is the noise condition which tend to give you less talk, uh, low temperature and aged pad, or the old pad, worn pad. Mm -hmm. N2 is a condition where talk tend to be high. There's a tendency. And the idea is we're going to take these two noise conditions and vary N1 and N2 and measure the talk. And what we are doing is let this N1 and N2 represent other noises. The idea is the most robust design against N1 and N2 should be the most robust against other noises. So we're looking for the tendency. We're looking for tendency. So this noise factor is very tricky. What kind of noise factor to use? What levels of noise factor to use? And usually we take one or two or three noise factor and we compound it. We call mm -hmm. it compounding. Then we vary the pressure, then vary the, say, uh, <coughs> torque, I mean noise, then measure the torque. So under N1, this would have response like this, say N1. Under N2, response may look like this. Tendency is low and high. You know that, that's the borders of that envelope we were looking at? Exactly. Or tendency, at least mm -hmm. tendency-wise, this is N1. This is N2. Gotcha. Well, other way around. Sorry. Anyway. Exactly. The tendency. Low, low response and high response mm -hmm. noise. So what noise factor to take? Uh, what levels to take? It takes a lot of discussions. Uh, often we need to do preliminary, preliminary experiment on the noise factors. Uh, so that in the robust design, of course, N2. Oops, I did it again, didn't I? N1 is low. Excuse me. N1 is low. N2 is high. N2 is high. N1 is low. Okay. So it became messy. But the point is, we, you want to squeeze the effect of noise. Mm -hmm. You got the, edge, the edges of the envelope, and you're trying to make that envelope as small as possible. That's right. That's right. And that's a robust design. And, and by creating that narrow, narrow envelope, mm -hmm. uh, you end up with that ideal function that you were looking at mm -hmm. uh, just a moment ago. That's right. Okay. Now. This may be, I may be going a little bit too far, but I want to even show you the idea of the signal-to-noise ratio, uh, how to calculate the signal-to-noise ratio. So from this set of data here, 
Of course, in the actual experiment, they measured a little bit more data than this one. I'm simplifying it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> from this set of data, we calculate signal to noise ratio. I'm sure you've heard of a uh, so-called least square regression. Sure, yeah. Yep. And it's very common <coughs> uh, technique uh, to fit the data uh, or fit the function through the data uh, for the best fit. So we do is simply least square regression through zero point. So this is least square regression and through zero point. Because physics calls, it has to go through zero. If pressure equal, equal to zero, torque better be zero. Otherwise, it's a dangerous square. So you've got a, a y-intercept of zero. That's right. And a single line, a linear function that represents the, the, the best estimate relationship betwe right. uh, between m and y. m and y, torque and pressure. That's right. Then we can estimate the slope, and that can be calculated. I'm not going to go through the calculation. No, pe people that have gone through you know, mm -hmm. high, high school algebra know how to do this. Yeah, or maybe college algebra. No, no. Yeah. I've seen it in high oh, school. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah, my, yeah. Do my daughter had it in high school about six, seven years ago. And calculation itself is very mechanical. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, computer would do it. So we calculate the slope. So SN ratio is uh, 10 times log. This is just a decibel transformation, mm -hmm. dB transformation. So uh, it's a log transformation. But what's important is this side. The numerator is beta square. Mm -hmm. the slope itself. Denominator is so-called mean square error, you might call it, or mean square deviation. Numerator, denominator is mean square deviation. That's nothing but average of a square of these distances. Mm -hmm. So this square plus this square plus this square plus this square plus so on. Gotcha. And divide by number of data. It's called mean square deviation, or some people call it mean square error. Mean square deviation. That's nothing but average of square of the distance, distances from mm -hmm. individual point to the best fit line. Understand. Okay. Now, and this is a signal to noise ratio. And, and this, this is true whether you're talking about bigger is better, yes, smaller is better, to, or nominal to, is best. You want to maximize this ratio. At and, all times. Yeah, and this is a so-called dynamic signal to noise ratio. And if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense because what does it mean if beta equal to zero? If beta equal to zero, okay, the best fit line is zero. The mm -hmm. slope equal to zero. It's, it it uh, is uh, parallel to or equal to the horizontal axis. In other words, the brake doesn't work. You see, this is what brake is supposed to do, or the pad and rotor, the friction couple is supposed to create. So you're trying to maximize the numerator. Exactly. And what does it mean when this quantity is large? It's, go, it's going to call the, the signal noise ratio to be smaller. And in other words, variability is large. That's so right. If mean square deviation is large, that means these individual points are mm -hmm. away from this specific line. In other words, it's not robust against the noise. Exactly. So this is what it's supposed to do, divided by what it's not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So too often, we tend to measure, for example, only the denominator or only the numerator. Mm -hmm. The numerator is just efficiency. So beta square is the power of the signal in the output. Mean square deviation is the power of noise in the output, and it's a signal to noise ratio. So for each condition of control factor, we have a set of data looking like this. So some condition, say within L18, some has high slope, high low slope, different variability. Mm -hmm. So it's going to have different uh, signal to noise ratio. And as a result, they were able to do this. Uh, after the experiment, of course, uh, we conduct prediction. Uh, well, after the experiment, we do the analysis just like this, calculate the signal to noise ratio, make a response table, and uh, based on the response table, we optimize the design that is best combination of the control factor. Then, naturally, we want to try the best combination and see what happens uh, and compare to the benchmark. Okay, so this is like a, a confirmation run. That's right. Then, in order to check it, 
we calculate prediction. And that is, at the best design, what is the predicted signal to noise ratio? We can calculate from this data analysis. Sure. Then we actually conduct the conformation run, and we compare these two. Uh, like, for example, uh, suppose from existing design, uh, we can suppose prediction was, say, 15 decibel improvement, 15 decibel improvement. And conformation may result in, right on the nose, 15 decibel improvement. Or it could be confirmation might say 12 decibel improvement mm -hmm. instead of 15. Or it could be 9 decibel improvement instead of 15. But when the confirmation result is not, is not right on the nose, we don't have to worry about it too much. As long as most of the gain you predicted reproduces. Uh, because this happens because of interaction among control factors. So we might predict a 15 decibel gain, but we only got 12. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it much. You could probably use something like a uh, confidence level, like a 90, 95% confidence level. Uh, mm -hmm. Use like you know 1.96 or let's say two standard deviations. Mm -hmm. If your uh, if your actual value mm -hmm. from the confirmation run was within uh, two standard deviations mm -hmm. of the uh, predicted value, yeah. uh, you could probably say you got a, you know 90, 95% mm -hmm. confidence mm -hmm. uh, that the levels that you have selected mm -hmm. for your parameter design uh, are correct. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Dr. T, well, I call him Dr. T and uh, his colleagues. I would call him dad if I were you. I have been, uh, uh, have written uh, the procedure to calculate the confidence interval for signal to reservation. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not the most important thing, really. Like, that is to say, <coughs> suppose, suppose current design, uh, current design or initial design, is suppose uh, uh, whatever uh, let me miss 10 dB, mm -hmm. okay. and the prediction, say just for discussion sake, is 30 dB mm -hmm. prediction, oh, optimum design. Now, so the prediction is 20 decibel gain. Okay, 20 mm -hmm. decibel gain, but it's not it's not so important how you see as long as you get something fairly close to 20 dB gain. Mm -hmm. And this thing happens because of a so-called interaction between the control factors. There's always some interaction uh, between the control factors. So, <coughs> but as long as we can gain uh, something like uh, uh, out of 20 dB, say you gain 16 dB or 17 dB, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, uh, that's yeah, a very successful experiment. Yeah, I would fact. say you go in and you implement it. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that you're all finished with experiments. Mm -hmm. And I think you know of, of the uh, comment uh, yes, from, uh -huh. from the gentleman at, at oh, uh, yes, Polaroid, right. mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we continue to conduct our experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, let's say that we take a, a 10 or 15 or 16 dB gain on this. Mm -hmm. We say, okay, we, cha we change our, uh, our, our parameter levels to, you know, to the ones that we came up with mm -hmm. uh, in that experiment, but that doesn't mean that we've stopped doing experiments. We can continue to do experiments, mm -hmm. perhaps with uh, additional factors and additional levels mm -hmm. uh, to determine uh, if perhaps it's going to be impossible to get all 20 dB gain, or maybe even go beyond that. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, oh yes. Second iteration might give you much more uh, decibels. Absolutely. And by the way, 20 decibel gain uh, is equivalent to reducing standard deviation to one tenth. One tenth. 20 decibel gain is a mm -hmm. huge gain. And maybe I should look, mention a little bit about the. Uh, um, loss function. Okay. okay. That is, <clears throat> we tend to talk about this, like when you gain so many decibels, like uh, actually we have uh, done experiment when uh, you gain like 20 decibels and 30 decibels, it's a tremendous gain. Uh, and when you change control factor levels uh, in upstream engineering, you can get this kind of gain. It's very amazing how much variability reduction uh, you can get just by changing control factor levels. And so instead of controlling the causes of variation, uh, we can make it robust against those causes of variation. And this thing I tend to talk about, especially when I talk to top management, that is, suppose this is a, say, lower spec limit. This is upper spec limit. Okay. And this is the target. On a, a critical design Yes, uh, we call it nominal, the best type of characteristic. Okay. It could be a coating thickness or something. 
So the typical there's a lower spec limit, upper spec limit. Say <coughs> whatever, uh, what say coating thickness target is uh, 50. Say 50 is a target, and spec limit might be uh, whatever 49.5 and 50.5 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> traditional with traditional quality improvement, suppose at the beginning you are not capable. So a lot of thickness is too low or too high. That you're going to have to inspect out or, or have a very unhappy customer. That's right. It's not meeting the spec, basically. Mm -hmm. In traditional quality thinking, what would you do when you make improvement to this point? Now you're meeting spec, mm -hmm. just about 100%. Usually what happens is you quit. Right? You say you're good enough, if you will, or you're meeting the spec. But what we love to do is to make even more improvement. Okay, well, I run out of space here, but... Uh, but your point's made. Okay. Uh, what, what kind of arguments don't you... I've, I've, <coughs> I know I've personally heard arguments when I mm -hmm. go out and do consulting mm -hmm. where, where people say, yeah, but that's going to cost us a fortune mm -hmm. to make it that tight. What do you say to them? Well, one big issue is this. How to become B2C without increasing cost or with minimum cost increase? Okay. Once you can achieve B2C, Okay, here's the real objective of, of robust design. And I'm going to go back to the, the break example and mention this again. When you achieve B2C, say, suppose, without increasing cost mm -hmm. or with small increasing cost. Okay. Once you can do this, here's a big question. Why improve from B2C? Right. Cost effectively, of course. Yeah, uh, one of the reasons is if, if the process mean should shift uh, even temporarily, mm -hmm. uh, the likelihood of having uh, the tails or the skirts of the distribution uh, go outside of either yes. the upper or lower spectrum, it can go it's, move it's dramatically reduced. Mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in other words, in general, what, what, is it, what, is it saying, what, is it, what, what is it saying? That is to say, what we are interested in is reducing something. Here's one word here. By reducing this something, mm -hmm. This is going to do this. Like, like you said, it's going to go back to the B. Mm -hmm. But or, it, or, it, could, or it, could, it could stay uh, exactly the same standard deviation mm -hmm. and have the mean shift uh, to the left or right, and you're still producing defect-free product. Okay. As long as, you see, okay, the point is you can afford to increase variability. Mm -hmm. right? What do you think this word is? This is a four-letter word. Ah, you see, why do you want to improve variability, reduce variability, cost effectively? Because cost reduction. With traditional thinking, once you meet the spec or tolerance, you're done. In other words, you are not interested in cost reduction. Mm -hmm. That's why we recommend to use. That's one reason we recommend to use orthogonal array, where, you see, suppose you conduct experiment with orthogonal array. And suppose you have many factors, A, B, C, D, F, G, H. As, a, as opposed to orthogonal array, suppose you do experiment one factor at a time, mm -hmm. or shotgun approach, or even full factorial with only three factors or so. Then what happens is, suppose you research A, factor A, and B, and C. Okay. And suppose you made enough improvement. Then what do you do? Suppose you meet, like, fact company B. Mm -hmm. Then what do you do? You quit, because the improvement is done. I meet the spec. I pack up and go home. Maybe drink Budweiser. Watch Monday Night Football, maybe. But the thing is, if you do orthogonal array, you have a chance to become A to C. Once you achieve this, you can reduce cost. This cost reduction can be, uh, you know, speed up the process, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, use cheaper material. Widen up the tolerances. Uh, that's action to reduce cost. In fact, that's what they did in this break example that uh, at the Nissan, they were able to do this, and they improved the slope, and they actually the slope became too high. Too high? Too high. So if you put this brake pad into the brake, it's going to be dangerous, right? Because it's, this works too well. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to bring down the slope. In fact, what they did was they got much better than required. So they were able to bring down the slope by reducing the size of the, size of the brake. 
by making the break smaller. In other words, you see, in other words, they met all those requirements such as cost, weight, uh, because less, you know, smaller, smaller because it's lighter mm -hmm. and less expensive, and performance is better. And also, they conformed the squeal noise became one twentieth, one twentieth in terms of occurrence of the squeal. Uh, I have to say, engineers were not sure by improving variability of torque, can they really reduce a squeal? Because it takes only small energy to create a squeal. However, they confirmed it. So, <coughs> in fact, it's lighter, cheaper, smaller, better performance, less NVH. The squeal is 120th in, terms, in terms of uh, occurrence weight. One stone, I, I don't know how many bars, maybe <laughs> seven bars or something. The idea is they measure the function, the actual energy transformation, or something to do with energy transformation, and reduce variability of that. I think that's fascinating that they, mm -hmm. that they got so good that they had to reduce the size of the brake. Exactly. Well, that was the objective. They wanted to do that. You see, they had in, that, in their mind... That was a long-term goal. Yes, that's right. They wanted to do it. Because a, a smaller brake is a less expensive brake. Less expensive, lighter. And yeah. So, again, I mean, going back to the uh, mechanical system on the video cassette tape recorder, mm -hmm. 18 years ago, it was heavy, bulky, expensive. But these days, it's light, robust. They were able to reduce cost because they improved performance. Very good. Well, let's continue on. Uh, mm -hmm. we, st we still want to. We've got about 15 minutes left, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure we respond to the question from the gentleman from uh, Polaroid too. Oh yes, um, the uh, the comment uh, uh, from this gentleman was uh, sometimes engineer may not necessarily uh, conform the improvement, or by doing experimentation. Uh, you know, they feel, okay, they have done, they check the performance, and they don't conform the improvement itself. Um, if conformation is not done, uh, that is a big problem, because there's always noise factors we might have missed. Uh, there's always some strong interactions that we don't know between the control factors. So it's better to conform, and of course, conform the improvement in terms of decibels. Uh, it's very important. And, uh, Do you have any recommendations to him with regard to the engineers that he works with? How, how to encourage these folks to, to conduct their confirmation runs? Um, but gentleman was also saying that uh, you know they are doing confirmation, but I'm not sure if uh, they are conforming the signal to noise ratio, okay. uh, the variability part of the function. That is, conforming the mean response. And that's a uh, uh, what we call two-step optimization uh, is a very important concept which I haven't mentioned about. Mm -hmm. uh, two-step optimization means exactly this example can be used. The first two-step optimization, first maximize signal to noise ratio. Mm -hmm. okay. Then second step is only to adjust the beta. Adjust the beta. And this is called two-step optimization. And in terms of uh, what we call nominal the best. Suppose, suppose uh, we are measuring uh, something like, a <coughs> say, coating thickness, say. These well, two. Obviously, we're getting away from the brakes now. Yes, we are. <laughs> OK. <laughs> this two, like, this is called nominal the best type of characteristics. But uh, that's a detail. Suppose you want to improve coating thickness. Variability, which is more difficult, reducing variability or adjusting the mean? Which is more difficult, reducing variability or simply adjusting the mean? Reducing variability is much more difficult than adjusting the mean. So of course, first step is to reduce variability. Okay. Uh, that is maximize signal to noise ratio. Uh, by the way, signal to noise ratio for nominal the best is 10 times log mean square divided by sigma square. And second step is to, of course, adjust the mean. 
And that's called two-step optimization. That is, it's much more difficult to reduce variability than uh, adjusting the mean. So, you know, just conforming the mean is not enough. Uh, it's, it, what I'm saying is, it's better to conform uh, signal to noise ratio if it, if it conforms or not. That's very important. Yeah, by, by using the signal noise ratio, you end up with the, uh, the opportunity to, cons to consider all the facets of you know, the mean, the, vari the variation, all simultaneously, mm -hmm. instead of trying to optimize one and then optimize the other and have to do some kind of trade-off. Mm -hmm. Well, the nominal the best SN ratio uh, is this equation somehow. This is a plus minus percent uh, variability. Coefficient of variation is sigma mm -hmm. over mean. And it's really the same thing as coefficient of variation. And you want to maximize this quantity. This is a measure of the variability, by the way, mean to the standard deviation. Okay. <coughs> um, let me make last point mm -hmm. in this presentation, which tends to be also a very important point. Um, So-called uh, function breakdown, let me call it. Okay, we're on slide six now. Thank you. So I'm using the slide that the people have. Um, in one company, uh, the, you know, again, th there was one project, and uh, the project team uh, was selected around so-called door-closing effort of automobile. Mm -hmm. And of course, door-closing effort has been, you know, I mean, it's industry-wide problem, you know, being too high or too low. This is like the number of pounds force required yes. to, mm -hmm. to close the door. That's okay. right, to reduce variability of door-closing door effort. Uh, in fact, this is the classical example of uh, measuring the quality. Uh, this is meaning this is a downstream symptom. Okay. Symptoms are high effort. And actually, engineer knows how to adjust the average effort. Just open up the gap between door and body. Mm -hmm. okay. Then effort is going to go down. The problem is water leakage, wind noise. You know, these are all symptoms. High effort is a symptom. Wind noise is a symptom. And you know, just like, a, uh, say, profit of company, in order to improve profit, what you need to do is improve functions, like you know, uh, marketing and sales, and engineering and R and D and manufacturing and procurement and all these different functions mm -hmm. needs to be improved in order to improve the profit. This is the same thing. It's a system output. It sure is a quality problem, but it's a symptom. Therefore, what we had to do was, actually it took us uh, two meetings to recognize this. It's a symptom. And uh, we said, okay, we need to break down into functions. And you no, know, you can do some kind of four tree analysis as well, FTA. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, then we end up with like weather slip function, design and manufacturing, door hinge, door design and manufacturing. This door manufacturing includes things like welding and stamping and sure. fixturing and all that, latch design and all, all these functions. Then what we did was, like for example, for weather slip, we had to think about, for example, and this happened to be a very successful case study, uh, we thought about what is the function of weather slip? Why it's there? How does it work? And what's the energy transformation? And we came up with the function of weather slip is a ceiling, isn't it? To seal the door. Mm -hmm. okay. That's why it's there. The ceiling is a function. So how does it seal? When the door is closed, when the door is closed, um, it gets compressed and provides a seal to make sure the weather, you know, keep the water out, the wind noise out. Mm -hmm. So the signal is force to compress. Output response is the seal force. Are these both measured in pounds? Uh, yes, pound or kg force, no, that's okay. not force. Yeah, both are force. The force in, force out. Okay. The function is by being compressed, it's supposed to provide the seal force. It's supposed to continue to provide the seal force. And uh, of course, there are control factors and noise factors. Okay. And one problem, uh, what's a very interesting thing is this. There were 
company, the supplier company, who's, who's been making the weather study for you know, uh, years, tens, mm -hmm. tens of years. And what's interesting is this supplier company had never measured the seal force before. We didn't know how to measure seal force. Of course, uh, the, the customer has many uh, specifications uh, to suppliers, such as you know, hardness, uh, compression load deflection, and many of these uh, specifications given to the suppliers, and it's been around for years. But I have to say, many of these specifications, you might want to look into it, because once you measure the function, many of those specifications you may not need. That is, we are creating, sometimes we are creating unnecessary specifications over the years. So that's something to think about. So what we had to do, I think I have five minutes or so. Yeah, it looks, looks to me like we've got about eight minutes. Eight let, minutes. Let me, let me use this okay. uh, to, for just a second to say to the audience that uh, mm -hmm. if, if you're going to call, better do it now <laughs> because uh, uh, very shortly uh, we're going to be winding this up. So uh, if, you, if Shin has said something that's uh, piqued your interest uh, or you've generated a question, give us a call and send us that fax. It needs to be here th within the next... Uh, four or five minutes or so if, if we're going to be able to do a decent job of responding to your question. Go. Cool. Yep. And uh, also, uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, send the question to American Supply Institute okay, uh, and by I, fax or phone call or, you know, we, we'll be glad to. I believe the, the phone number and the fax number for ASI mm -hmm. is on the very first page of the set of handouts that they have. Yes, had. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me finish up this ex example, and I have a very important point to make on this example. Okay. So. Therefore, <coughs> okay, for the com force to compress is the input signal. Seal force is an output response. Um, and like I, s I talked about in the break example, there's an ideal function, and there's still some... Uh, how do I say, discussion about this ideal function. But at least close to zero, m equal to zero, mm -hmm. we like to create CO force. With a very high beta. With a high beta, exactly. And that's the ideal function. But what's the reality? So force to compress, CO force, and reality. Reality is, here we go, like this. I might be exaggerating. Uh, yeah, but your point is made. Yeah. So in order to assure certain seal force, suppose this is a seal force you need to assure, you need high door closing effort. Mm -hmm. you know, the high door closing effort is a symptom. You know, they have to set the high door closing effort, that is set the gap so that the effort becomes high because they have to seal. You see? So that's a, you see, this is typical of measuring the quality and uh, you end up with a uh, trading off, or you end up with the so-called whack-a-mole engineering. <laughs> Solving one problem creates another problem. You know, reducing the le uh, leakage uh, might increase the uh, door closing effort, and so on. So, of course, naturally, you want to reduce this variability, like this. Sure. In this case, high slope is desired, and so on, so that uh, you have, you see, the quality problem is a symptom of variability of energy transformation. And like I mentioned, uh, this company, uh, we didn't know how to measure the seal force, actually, so we had to make a fixture. Let me do it quickly. Uh, in the fixture, here's a weather slip. It's a sandwiched weather slip. Here's a weather slip. So <coughs> it's a metal and metal. A fixture is made such a way uh, signal can be valid, it can be measured, the mm -hmm. force to compress, this over the slip. So this is simulating door and body. And we put the airflow into this fixture. And naturally what happens is after you compress the weather slip, put the airflow, then pressure increases inside. And measure, and pressure increases, PSI, pressure increases, and at a certain pressure, it starts to leak. Uh, it pressure becomes so high that uh, with a slip cannot hold the pressure anymore, that it starts to leak. So we recorded this maximum <coughs> pressure as a seal force.
And at least it, those measures, we agreed upon this measure, stability to see you, to see you force. And this fixture was, uh, I think I can say this, uh, 70K costed $70,000. Mm -hmm. It seems expensive, but they said at the end it's very cheap. And they did it, we did this kind of experiment. And in the experiment, you know, we made, we made, you know, so, something like this, this kind of improvement. I think we doubled the beta and reduced the standard deviation by 15%, uh, 20% or something That's like terrific. That. Yeah. However, the biggest, how do I say, bunk for the buck? No. Bang. Bang okay. for the buck. Okay. Is what they said was, you know, after the spending the $70,000, the, the biggest benefit from this kind of experiment is the following. That is, before this experiment, they have been measuring door closing effort. And when can you measure door closing effort? Door closing effort can be only measured at the stage of prototype. That is, after door is designed, everything designed, and you fit the first prototype of the car, door closing effort is measured. And suppose there's a problem with door closing effort. What happens? Usually, I maybe shouldn't say this, but uh, finger, po finger pointing oh, okay. among the subsystems. You scared me. I didn't know what you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Finger pointing. That is, okay. you know, the, each subsystem is points finger to each other. That uh, you know, it's your fault. It's your fault in a way. Mm -hmm. And you know, whoever has the least voice gets the redesign. Yeah. And you get into this model of so-called uh, what do you call it? design, build, and test. Design, build, and test. Design, build, and test. And design, build, and test. Shin, we're, we're getting pretty close to the end mm -hmm. here. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say to the uh, gentleman from uh, Polaroid uh, in, uh, as a final remark with, with response to his question uh -huh. uh, before we close this out? Uh, I think I meant to answer the question by, uh, by uh, or commented on the uh, comment the gentleman had by saying importance of a confirmation and mm -hmm. importance of conforming the variability. And but let, let me finish this one. Okay. okay, we've only got about a minute and a half, so. Okay. Now, so therefore, now this company using this fixture, mm -hmm. they can do this for the future product. Instead of measuring door closing effort around this stage right. and do a firefighting engineer. And with a lot of noise factors involved. That's right. So, of course, they took the noise factor into this experiment as well. And so. It's, it's very important to think about what to measure as a data so that we can be ready for the future product. That is, make the generic function robust mm -hmm. so that uh, we can utilize that information for the family of the product. And this experiment really taught us that lesson. That's terrific. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the two hours are just about up. And I'll take uh, this moment to say thank you to Shin for an You're outstanding welcome. job. I hope I you did, did what I was supposed you, to do. You did the job. Okay. And uh, appreciate let, it. Let me remind you that uh, next month, uh, June 1995, I'll be back uh, with Dr. George Box from the University of Wisconsin at, at Madison. And uh, Dr. Box will be talking to us about the subject of classical design of experiments, uh, an interesting counterpoint to what, to, what Shin had, has had to say uh, to us today. Mm -hmm. And so on the second Monday of June 1995, I'll see you at that time with Dr. George Box. And for today, thank you very much. This is Continuous Improvement TV. Thank you. Bye now.